Hey, Scott from Aristocob.com here. And Seth from MyWeenerYourMouth.com. So I just re-upped on that uh, because it was about to expire. Did you really? I did. Uh, I hated paying the $18 or whatever it was for another year of that, but it is in so many of our videos that I can't let it go. And then it'll be bought up by someone and then they'll, uh, you know, do something with it. I don't know. Uh, I can't, can't let go of that. Uh, but together, the three of us, <laughs> we are MyWienerYourMouth.com. We are Mark with Ben's Breakfast Club. Yeah, if you go to MyWienerYourMouth.com, you end up here at this channel. We've talked about this for years. I don't know that we've ever just gone, come out and said it. We said, hey, if you go there, you won't be disappointed. We've tried to hint it. It's this channel. And it doesn't matter how you spell Wiener because he screwed paid, up the first time. Both. The first time he bought it. Oh my goodness! So there, the, there is a story surrounding that URL. We've told it enough times that um, just search for it. Just go find it. You'll you'll find it. You'll see what it's all about. Uh morning, boy. Morning. Having trouble with the Zippo. Mm. So today we are smoking Boswell's Northwoods, mm. another uh, leftover tobacco, Advent tobacco, sent in by Lutrasaurus, or is it Lutra, I don't know, on YouTube. Um, so today I thought it might be nice because it, it has been a while and we've mentioned last week that we've been traveling quite a bit, um, to just uh, share some of the highlights of, of recent travel if you have any. Um, now, I certainly have a couple of things I think might be interesting topics to discuss um, for my recent trips. Let's, let's start with you. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I, I, a couple weeks ago, was in Austin, Texas. Uh, this is the second time I've been to Austin in the last four months. Um, so it was a nice, nice trip out there. Uh, we go, for this particular event, this is one of those events where we generally see the, the airport, the hotel, and nothing else. Um, but it, it, normally this event takes place in a resort off the beaten path. In Austin, it actually takes place in the downtown city area. And so we got a chance to see Sixth Street. Um, we got a chance to go on a musical history tour through Austin, which was fascinating. Uh, I think the most interesting part of that is um, we got to go to the east side of the city. And um, during, after World War II, I think, maybe one, um, the city was was segregated um, at the river. The river runs north to south and uh, separates the east from the west. And so the east side was the black side of town and, and they were relegated to that side. Um, and uh, as a result, um, Austin being such a musically focused town, uh, they ended up having uh, some venues there that hosted just the top of, of the top uh, world famous black musicians um, would come in and they would all play uh, what started out as like a lean to and became a restaurant uh, and venue there. And so now uh, we were part of our tour took us over to that side and, and there's a mural and um, you know, there's all of this history of, of, it was part of the circuit that these musicians would play. And so they would all come through town yeah. and um, uh, you know, seeing that was, was just fascinating. It's one of those situations where there is um, uh, some historical preservation that's taken place. Um, it's actually very, very close to Franklin Barbecue. Um, is is very close. Yes, and you to sent me is. a picture because you're a jerk. I didn't get to go. I mean, the bus <laughs> drove past. It's all the line out out front. Um, but it, it is a part of part of the city that is now. Um, uh, subject to gentrification like crazy. Um, Ten years ago... Can you define gentrification for me? Yeah, um, when you have a poor part of town that is uh, up and coming and is is um, being really overrun by uh, more wealthy, affluent uh, people coming in, and so oftentimes it results in um, uh, sketchy, um, uh, uh, questionable uh, practices by landlords as prices start to go up because the property value is increasing. Um, the people that built that community can't afford to live in that community any longer and they have to move out. Um, you then have, uh, like like we see it in Greensboro, we have some of these um, old textile facilities and, and um, the, these 
you know, a lot of times you'll see them in, in parts of town that is textile, like textile. Textile, yep. Um, and uh, you'll 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 have these parts of town um, that used to be used for manufacturing. As the manufacturing left that part of town, um, all of the people who were factory workers uh, can't find new jobs, and so property value drops. Um, but then what happens is those factories start uh, becoming hip um, offices for millennials, and you know they they, they take. They take the, the old and mix it with new aesthetic. A lot, lot of uh, breweries, yes. little microbreweries open up, and and, and as that table. happens, then you get more. You get n a new generation of people coming in. They're bringing their money with them, and so Austin now has headquarters for Facebook, Amazon, and Google, um, and uh, so you have a lot of these, a lot of these uh, millennials, Gen Zers with disposable income wanting to come in to the town but live just outside of town and that's in this neighborhood and with a lot of history and so uh, the guy was telling us he's got a friend that that has a small um like two bedroom home and as we drove through the neighborhoods we're driving through through homes that in north carolina would be eighty thousand seventy thousand dollar homes he said his buddy 10 years ago bought a ninety thousand dollar house that was appraised last year at nine hundred fifty thousand oh dollars, and so we're driving past these seventy thousand dollar, eighty thousand dollar homes, and it's a million dollar neighborhood, and you wouldn't know it by looking at it, but it's just that's uh, the cost of, of living there um, for the people that are coming mm. in, and so that's you know sad um, to see that to see that the people that, that really built, but it, it's neat the to history. see it's neat to see a, a town revitalized. Yep. An area of town because this this has happened in a lot of places. A lot of places. happened in Cincinnati. Uh, I, I know for sure. Um, we got a little bit in Greensboro. There's a little bit in High Point. Even the little teeny weeny town that you're in, down in uh, in in Ashboro, has an area of town that has become yeah, somewhat downtown. gentrified as well. So it, it happens, and you know you you feel bad about it. At the same time, you got to say this is a part of town that was dying, right? And there were no jobs, and there were no opportunities. But yeah, the, the very people that that was their home can't afford to live there. Sad. They, they can't, and and you know they are not. Their situation doesn't improve because the p same people that that um, worked in factory jobs are probably not the people that are going to be getting a job at Google. Right. They're saying welcome they to don't, Walmart. They don't have and shopping carts. Yeah, they don't. They don't have the, the skill set. And, and so, you know, if there are no jobs, they're in a bad place. Um, if there are jobs that they can't get, they're in a bad place. Right. And so they get, they get pushed out. Um, you know, so it was nice to see the history part of it is still intact. Uh, you do question how long will that be the case. Um, but it was, it was fascinating. Uh, had some, a lot of really great brisket. Um, a lot of really great barbecue while there. And it was a, it was a, it was a good trip. There's there's a lot of great barbecue in Texas. Yeah, definitely in Austin. Um, they don't have a unique style of barbecue in Austin. It's it's a Texas style barbecue. Um, so lots and lots of beef. Mm -hmm. Very little pork, but there's mm -hmm. some. There's some there. It's funny because it's like it's the opposite here. We get very little beef, and oftentimes when you do see brisket on the menu. It's hit and miss. Mm -hmm. um, one of the places that we find ourselves uh, going on a lot of Friday nights because they have a great special with a pork chop, pork loin chop. You'll see on my Aristo Grub Instagram feed that same picture coming up time and time again because every Friday almost we order that. They have a brisket on the menu that some days has been fantastic yeah. and some days not great. So I tend to not order it unless I'm ordering as part of like a two or three meat combo. Mm -hmm. um, we did go down to the smokehouse in um, Salisbury mm -hmm. the other day, and I had some tremendous burnt ends mm. and uh, sausage, they do a smoked sausage there. But most North Carolina barbecue places, that's not what they do. They do uh, pork shoulder. Mm. So, Well, it's interesting too, the guy that ran the tour, um, got to hear some, some local musicians who apparently um, are just legends um, of, of that scene. What, what is the style, the musical style now? Uh, apparently, apparently, according to the tour, within Austin, it's everything. Um, the style is everything. You, when you think Austin, you, when you think Texas, you think um, country, uh, western. country western. Um, Austin, according to the tour guide, is the city uh, where 
people that live in Texas, born in Texas, that don't want to live in Texas anymore, move to. <laughs> and so, so the, the majority of people living in Austin are originally from Texas. They're not outsiders. They've come in, um, but they, they tend to have a more liberal mindset. And, a lot and, of Californians in Texas. In, 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 Austin. in Austin. I believe that too. Um, and, uh, and so according to them, there's a lot of styles. Uh, what we saw was blues. Um, the musician we, we saw was, was a, a blues band and they were phenomenal. Apparently they um, are just famous. Uh, the, the duo we saw um, played with everybody there is to, to play with and um, uh, you know a lot of history just there. Um, so that was neat. So predating you, there used to be a show on uh, public television called The Austin City Limits. It's still on. Is it still on? It's still on, like 35 years, 40 years. Wow. Yeah. And it, well, and it, I don't, I don't watch it. No, <laughs> but, no, but it's bigger. But years ago, I used to yeah. catch it every now and then. Back when there were fewer choices. It was choices, on the airplane. When there were fewer choices on TV, yeah. you know, you had four channels at best. Uh, used to catch some some acts on The Austin City Limits. Yeah, so they took us to a couple of statues, one of Willie Nelson, one of another musician that anyone who... Stevie Ray Vaughan, probably. Probably, yep. Um, died in a helicopter crash, mm -hmm. plane crash, Stevie maybe. Stevie Ray Vaughan, yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah, I, uh, on yes. the river. I think so. That sounds right. Um, talked about Austin City Limits. It, it was on, my, on like my airplane, so my most recent trip I flew from Raleigh, North Carolina to London. On that plane, there were Austin City Limits videos hmm. on American Airlines. Yeah, that could be watched. I didn't watch any of them. But yeah, they, they have a big studio, like huge, uh, like arena now that they, they do it. One of the interesting things is they took us down 6th Street. Now 6th Street has more um, liquor licenses on a single street than any other place in America. And so it is the most populated place like for... Beale for, Street in Memphis or... Yeah, the French Quarter in, in New yeah. Orleans. It's just bar, 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 bar. Um, he said that uh, during a standard week, he, sa he said the weekend in Austin starts on Thursday and it's on Wednesday. Um, he said during a standard week, uh, there may be something like um, 2,000 people on the, the bars. On the weekend, it goes up to like 5,000. Um, during their big uh, like uh, Halloween, it goes up to 30,000. And then during South by Southwest, there may be 150,000 people. Wow. They shut off the whole part of town. He, sound, he made it sound like a furniture market. He said the locals, locals go camping. They rent out their home, home and they go camping. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it becomes a pedestrian promenade. Mm -hmm. um, you know who lives down that way is uh, Dodif. Mm. Lives in that, that area. I was there one time where I got to hang out with Dodif and his bride for uh, some pizza one night. Good time. Well, I, I've, I've traveled quite a bit, and, and we, you didn't even talk about London, but let me uh, jump yeah, in and please. tell probably for me what was one of the more interesting places I've been. I was in um, um, she Sheboygan? Mm. No, not Sheboygan. That's Wisconsin. I was in, dang it, what is the name of that town? It'll come to me. I was in um, North eastern indiana at a woodworking show and it is a show that is is almost entirely attended by amish people and i posted a picture on the my growth rings instagram feed um uh, that's where i post stuff that's primarily tool related is that different from wood wishes it's uh there is no wood wishes instagram feed uh <laughs> Uh, anyway, what is the name of that town? Why is it not coming to me? So part of what I was doing there was my employer has a booth and then I was asked to do a couple presentations on LED lighting. Probably 10 years ago, I did an LED lighting seminar at a, uh, a woodworking event in Arthur, Illinois, another one that was predominantly Amish. And I remember scratching my head when I, I asked the guy that set the thing up, why am I talking about LED lighting to people who live by candlelight and by lamps and things? And they said, oh, these folks use a lot of LED because they're required by law to have LEDs on their buggies. Mm. They have to have lighting on their buggies. And, um, you know, 
generating electricity isn't so easy for them. So if they're going to charge some batteries, they want those batteries to stay charged. So they use LEDs. And so it wasn't a surprise to me that I was doing a presentation on LEDs this time. What was weird to me, <laughs> part of my presentation, which was created by the, uh, the German headquarters of, the, of my employer, <laughs> was in talking about trends in LED lighting for cabinets and furniture, one of the trends was talking about them being used in micro-living, also known as, as um, tiny homes. Tiny homes. And I'm trying to explain in layman's terms to my audience the fact that people are, are living in smaller, more meager housing with less amenities. Not just not less amenity, amenities, but just uh, you know less worldly possessions, if you will. <laughs> and the stares I'm getting from people as I'm trying to say, so maybe they only have two, three flat screen TVs, right? <laughs> And, and one of the pictures that I had in my presentation showed this tiny house with a staircase, and the staircase was lit with LED ribbon. So basically, everything in that home kind of has to do double duty. Right. It's a staircase. It's also it's storage. <laughs> it's also lighting. And um, but that was that was just funny to try to say that to folks that live far more meager than anything in my PowerPoint presentation, and to some of them. That they brought their families in because just to sit and watch a PowerPoint presentation mm. is, to some, very Thanks. exciting and, and unusual, and uh, to hear about what's going on because these folks are building cabinets and furniture that they in turn sell to what they call the English. They sell to us, and so they're using a lot of these products, just not in their homes. Right. They're building with them, but not... Yeah, they're building with them, and so their, their customers are asking for these products. Yeah. And uh, I remember a couple of years ago, I did a presentation. This was in Arthur, Illinois, a different time in Arthur. The presentation was titled um, something like, where, where, did, where Did the Walls Go? And mm -hmm. basically, it was explaining to them one of the trends that was going on back, let's say, six years ago when these open floor plans were becoming popular, where you had mm -hmm. the living room and the dining area and the kitchen would all oh. flow together and all open. And what they lost were a couple walls that typically would have wall cabinets. Mm -hmm. So that means that what cabinets remain in the kitchen have to be super functional and not just lighting, but things like um, organization units, not just your drawers, but maybe pantries or things that pull down from upper cabinets and stuff like that. And uh, so that, that was fun to talk to people about that, that, you know, they are being asked to build cabinets, but they're being asked to build fewer wall cabinets. Mm. Why? And why the sudden interest in all these organizational things? Because there's less, one of the slides I had in that presentation had, uh, it was filled with nothing but products made by Ron Poheel. And my point was, hey, look at all these things that we have and the, that we need to store. You know, the in the eggshell egg scrambler <laughs> and the, uh, the the beer mug froster and the uh, the the smokeless ashtray. And I, I just had just the you know, the pasta pocket fisherman. the pasta maker, the pocket fisherman, all these things. And I had people coming up after the presentation saying, were those real? <laughs> people really have those things? Some do. <laughs> yeah, can't live without them. You know, the wild thing is that you, there are some people that uh, either live in tiny homes or tiny home advocates that would think the Amish live in excess. Because how much space are you wasting? I mean, that's that's such a big part of it is is real estate. Big, big real estate, land. Yeah. Right? I mean, the Amish, yes, they, they don't have amenities in their home. They don't have all of those other things. But they, they have land. They, they're farmers. They're you know, living off of that. Yeah. That would be a oh, foreign concept yeah. to some people. Well, especially if you've, got, if you've got somebody who's vegan yeah. living in a tiny home. Mm -hmm. They'd have a problem with all the animals. Right. Um, yep. And then immediately following that trip, I was off to That's Denver. Funny. And um, I was sharing with one of the guys there I was traveling with the, uh, the story about the Amish. And um, he's like, man, so where, where are the Amish in the United States? It's like, well, there's yeah, like three everywhere. communities in, in Colorado. Yeah. What? Yeah, it's they're they're everywhere. They're, 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 they're everywhere. The roads don't go. Yeah, right. And it, but it's because at some point, yeah, you, know, you got a farm, 
and these farm farmers have pretty large families to help them with the farm. Well, the oldest kid is going to inherit the farm. Maybe dad's still living and healthy, so they're gonna split that farm. And maybe a couple of the kids split the farm. Well, the youngest kid's gotta go somewhere. Yeah. And, and it's bad form to just leave the community. And uh, so they, they basically will have a group of people that will basically agree to move on and start a new community somewhere. Mm. So, yeah, they're all over there. They're in Mexico. There's uh, mm. Mexican Amish. I'd love to hang out with some Mexican Amish. That would be yeah. fun. I don't know why I think that would be you fun. But you don't need a battery yeah. for a tortilla press. So. <laughs> That's true. Did, did Ron Popeil ever make a tortilla press? I don't think he did. He, did, he should have. Oh, but the corn ballers probably sold them. There. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't touch the corn baller. Well, while, he's, while he was in Denver, I uh, flew out to London convention, spent um, from London, so this is, if this is uh, the UK, you've got uh, England and, and Scotland, landed in London, went up to Stratford-upon-Avon, which is just south of Birmingham, which is kind of in the center. Uh, from there, spent some time in York, we went uh, coast to coast, we went to Newcastle, over here, uh, then um, are we in Scotland at this point? Not yet. That, that's up here. At it the, is okay. Uh, so we from from uh, Newcastle drove to Edinburgh, Scotland. Scotland. Um, from there drove to uh, Stirling, and then from Stirling drove up to um, Loch Ness. Uh, wound up through. Um, we didn't go to Glasgow, but we went to Glencoe. And then from Glencoe to uh, Loch Ness. Still had a ways north left to go, but didn't go all the, all that way. Made it to Loch Ness and, and went back to Edinburgh. Then from Edinburgh down to Stratford, from Stratford down to London, stayed there for a few more days. Um, so had a ten day, ten, ten day trip. Ten day trip. Spent a couple of days in most of those places. Um, you know, the highlights there. So last year went to Ireland and um, Ireland, Northern Ireland, Stratford upon Avon, and London. So. Uh, lots of time has been spent in Stratford upon Avon. Uh, it is the birthplace and death place, burial place of William Shakespeare. Um, and so, you know, we stayed in a hotel, modern hotel. Uh, the hotel was purchased six months ago. It was a different hotel before, um, but the building itself is a building that was around during the time of Shakespeare. Um, it has these big wooden uh, beams in the walls that are uh, some of them kind of bending uh, with time and. Um, so that was cool, but then, uh, so it was neat getting to see some more of the country that we had not seen before. And then, uh, one of the highlights was, uh, going up to Scotland. So, um, my, my coworker and I decided, Hey, uh, we want to take the weekend off We're we're going to be there basically two weeks with a weekend in between. Um, let's do something relaxing because we're cramming a lot of business into those normal work days. So we uh wound up um deciding hey let's let's drive around scotland and uh last trip took a year ago i did a little bit of driving uh, which is weird driving in the wrong side of the car on the wrong side of the road um and so i said you know i feel pretty comfortable doing that so let's we, we needed a rental car anyway to get around the city or to get around the country and um so we dropped off our sales guy our local sales guy um and uh, took off to Edinburgh. I did the driving, so I ended up driving m uh, about, about I think, 1,600 miles all told. You should told. say this in kilometers because that's more. Well, it, it is, but it wasn't in kilometers this time, <laughs> thankfully. I was worried about that. So last time uh, in in Ireland, they used kilometers per hour. How many, how many rods to the, yeah, that's to right, the to hogshead do you get? In, uh, in Ireland, they use kilometers. In Northern Ireland, they use miles. And uh, our car that we rented last year in Ireland what only had kilometers per hour. So when we drove up and the signs changed to miles per hour, we were having to do math on the fly <laughs> to try to figure that out. Um, so the highlights of that, uh, one of the things that made me, so we went to Edinburgh, there's a castle there, we got to see some cool stuff. In Edinburgh, had some really great meals. Um, 
there. And then the day trip that we took to Loch Ness, we ended up going to Stirling and visited Stirling Castle. So Stirling is the um, where the, the battle, I cannot remember the name of it, but the battle uh, of Braveheart, uh, William Wallace, that battle between the Scots and the, the English take, took place there, um, the historical battle. And there is a monument to, to William Wallace um, the castles there and from the castle you can see uh, they point out landmarks as to where the actual fighting took place um, and uh, we went from there to a distillery and the distillery had some we got to try some scotch uh, scotch whiskey and one of them I had I never had this before I never had a scotch with peat in it um, and the process as it was described uh, reminded me an awful lot of Latakia uh, because they're they're smoking, they're burning the peat moss, and they're smoking it through the um, through the whiskey. I think um, either through the whiskey or the barrels, but it sounded like it's... I would think that they would burn the peat and make charcoal, and then filter through that. It's possible. This is a guy that doesn't drink who's right. describing this. I don't know. It's possible. I'm sure many of you know better than me. Uh, the way it was described, it sounded like the smoke is actually uh, what is is filtering through. And so it reminded me a lot of the process of, of Latakia. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it also, flavor-wise, it tasted smoky. And it, it had that kind of pre-smoked um, mm -hmm. flavor to it, almost. And it was very interesting. It was the first time I've, I've tried that. You know, normally I'm drinking bourbon. Uh, so that was neat. And then... Um, By the way, that's, uh, that's Latakia. For those folks yes. that you would have been hanging out with in England, if you had, yeah. if you had gone to the, the I pipe didn't get shop a, I didn't there. get a chance. The only day I had to go to the pipe shop was uh, Sunday, and it was closed. Mm -hmm. um, I would have loved to have gone, but um, and so going to the Highlands was fascinating. If you ever get a chance to just drive through there, I highly Is recommend it, it. Are the lands high there? They are. They are. So there is a, a fault line and. Um, the, the lowlands in Scotland and England fell into the sea. They fell um, to a, a lower elevation than the highlands. And so it literally is high land. So you're driving up into mountain range, there's, there's snow peaks and stuff. Um, the four hour drive from Edinburgh to, to Loch Ness, what, the only thing I can think of, with the exception of like the, the part of the highlands that you see in Highlander or um, uh, James Bond, Spectre, or um, Harry Potter, right? Very iconic, kind of rolling hills. Um, looks looks a lot like um, looks a lot like the parts of New Zealand that uh, Lord of the Rings was filmed in. Um, kind of very iconic look. Uh, that's a very small part of the drive. Mm -hmm. What you see, the rest of the drive was what I just I I can't help but imagine what driving from the east coast of the U.S. To the west coast is but in four hours instead of four days uh, and so it's wow. it's wild we would we would be driving along a road with with mountains um, driving through basically a mountain pass like we would if we're driving through the Appalachian Mountains in North Carolina and then all of a sudden it, it changes in and the terrain changes and there's a lake there and you're driving through kind of this this uh, more ri uh, river run which we get in parts of the mountains by the way if you're thinking I think he means Appalachian Mountains. Not if you're from North Carolina. Yeah. Appalachian. Appalachian. Um, and then, and then uh, kind of opens up to more like a plains. And then uh, there's mountains and you're hmm. in a mountain range. And uh, I mean, it was wild. It, mountains it was, like the Rocky Mountains different? Is that different than what you... Yeah, so there was, there was part of like, yes, yes, different, you know, uh, not Appalachian Mountains, but like Rocky Mountains, taller peaks, not... Not nearly the scale, not not even close to the scale, but you know snow caps and and much higher, and then and then you're you're in like plains and there's sheep everywhere, and <laughs> it, it, literally, literally you round a corner and you are in a completely different terrain, mm. and you drive for another twenty minutes and you round another corner and the terrain has changed completely. It was the most bizarre experience um, driving around there. And so, do you, uh, do, you, do you have time to talk about? something you bought there? I do, something yeah. Something you ate there? Because those are two topics uh, I'd love to hear more about. Absolutely. So uh, every single meal I had in Scotland, I ate haggis. Um, if you are unfamiliar, haggis is the spam of Scotland. 
Um, they take all of the... I'm sure they'd love to hear that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the hot dog of Scotland. They, they take all of the spare parts of the lamb, um, predominantly, uh, that they can't really cook uh, by themselves, grind it up into almost a sausage. They add some flavor to it. And they cook it in uh, a sheep's stomach. And um, I had it on mashed potatoes, which is great. Uh, had it in a um, uh, fry. They, they took what I think is probably fish and chip um, mm. uh, yeah. breading, uh, or it's not, but flour, and and fried it. And so it was almost like a, a hot pocket. Um, it was so good. Had it uh, as a topping on a burger the last day. Wow. Um, yeah, it was. I would eat it all the time. I would eat it all the time. It was very, very, very flavorful. I don't know why. I mean, I, I know why we don't eat it. We don't have sheep to that quantity. But um, you know, we're busy eating pigs in North Carolina now, and there brisket is in there is Texas, something but. that is traditionally in haggis that they're not allowed to put. Is it brain or what is it that uh, might be? That's how you end up with mad cow. So, yeah. but I'm not sure. Okay. And then the last day there. Uh, last day in Scotland, we uh, did a little bit of gift shopping, and um, you know, I had joked with Allison that I'm going to Scotland. Uh, I don't know if I'll ever go back to Scotland. I'm getting a claymore. I'm getting a, a claymore. claymore. Is the a mine? It's the sword wielded by William Wallace. It's uh, the famous. It's the sword that people associate with um, with Scotland. And so uh, I go to this gift shop. They have them. They're the exact same ones that I can get from Bud K or Smoky Mountain <laughs> Knife Works for cheaper and then not have to Maybe figure out how to China, get them. China, India. Not, uh, Spain, actually. Spain, yeah. okay. No, figure out, not, not having to figure out how to get them home. But around the corner, I see that they have a letter opener. Uh, and so this is a Claymore. Um, it's a letter opener. And so I can say that I bought a Claymore in Scotland. Um, have a little stand that came with it. But the wild thing is, that's not where the story is. I mean, it's fun, but the story is that in the UK, they feel so strongly about knife violence because they don't have guns. Um, and, and knife violence is pretty prevalent. Uh, they feel so strongly about it that I had to give the guy at basically a Scottish Spencer's Gifts, right? It's like like a uh, just a uh, random tchotchke shop had to give the guy a copy of my driver's license and passport. Had to have two forms of photo identification to be added to a database to purchase this because a blade over six inches long is something that they're tracking. And there are parts of, of the UK where if you have a pocket knife, if you possess something uh, like this on your person, um, it is you can go to jail. You can go to jail for having just a, a, a pocket knife, which is such a foreign concept to me. I always have a pocket knife. Always. I travel with one in my in my uh, checked luggage so that I can have one wherever I, I am. Um, and, uh, yeah, apparently you can have it in a bag, but if you have it on your person, you can go to jail. <laughs> so that was weird. That was bizarre. Um, so Scotland was the best. Uh, wound up in London. Um, an event we attended was at the House of Lords. And so that was kind of cool. Um, to to get to be there right in the middle of it. Um, ended up getting a message from mom um, that said, said, please call me as soon as you can. Freaking out. It's like 10 o'clock at night. Don't know what the heck is going on. Thinking the worst. I step outside, try to call her, and she, said, and, and she doesn't even pick up. She just texts me back, sorry, I meant that for your dad. But I take the moment, I have, I've stepped outside of this pub, um, and I take a moment to just take a, pan, a panoramic video and say, look, there's Big Ben, there's the House of Commons, there's the House of Lords, there's Westminster Abbey. It's so cool to just step so out there, where you yeah. are and just, you're right in the middle of history. And there are, there are rocks that we're walking on that are older than our country. Does it make you think of Guy Fox? Uh, no, there was... That didn't. Somebody else... Did. They recommended the next time we come. There's a there's a, an exhibit you can attend that um, is where they like they had their planning meetings and stuff. It's like a, a museum there wow. that you can go into. So it was super cool. A good mix of of work, a lot of work, um, and also um, you know, our, our company we make uh, P 
piece of kitchen equipment where we um, had a meeting with the National Federation of Fish Friars. Um, it's a, the fish and ship uh, group. They do training and stuff. They take that very seriously. Well, this is the place where the fat bird came from, right? It is, yeah. It is. Yep. Uh, they don't have grease traps, um, many of them in uh, the UK, and so they get blockages real bad in this, these old sewer systems. So I think there's a, a lot of opportunity. I will be going back probably again this year um, and, and probably again in the years to come. So it was a good trip That's great. overall, but super neat. Also discovered something I did not get to see last time in London. There is a whole life of the city that takes place underground, under the streets. Um, besides the subways. Besides the subways. Wound up going to several places that are underground. Uh, a couple of speakeasies, um, a bowling alley slash skating rink. Um, underground like the only entrance you see just an, a street level entrance um, with some stairs going down and when you go down it's this huge massive complex I guess when your your city streets are hundreds of years old and you have businesses that have been in there for hundreds of years uh, going down or going up are really the only options and, and we haven't perfected the sky city yet but when when we do they will have it I'm sure so I'm, I'm, my phone is buzzed a couple times I'm I'm bidding on something on eBay. Mm. You gonna win? I don't know yet, but I, I hope to. I hope to. I want to talk about it until I do. Mm. It's, well, not, it's not pipe related. It's actually woodworking related. So find out on Woodwishes on Instagram. I'll be going to Indianapolis if I, this if week I, too. If, if I win, I will post it on my growth rings on Instagram. You going where now? Indianapolis, mm. Indiana. Have you been? Uh, no. Uh, you're uh, driven, driven, driven through. Yeah. You going to the uh, the racetrack? Mm -mm. You should make a point to. Mm. They got a museum right in the middle of the of the track. I weren't seeing. It's not a not even a forty eight hour trip. I'm flying you know? in flying in on Wednesday afternoon, giving a presentation that I tried to back out of. Uh, Thursday morning and then flying home Thursday night. What, what's cool at this museum, they've got the winning car from many of the years as you go through this museum. And there was a car that changed the world of racing that's on display there. Um, it was the very first car that had a rear view mirror. Mm. And this car um, only required one person in it, the driver. And up until that point, you always had to have a driver and a mechanic. Mm -hmm. And where did the mechanic ride? The mechanic rode laying across the hood, and they were there to provide ballast and, you know, in, in, in corners and things like that. And part of their job was to keep an eye behind the car on what's coming up. And uh, so this guy invented this car that was super reliable. He knew he could race it without the need for a mechanic. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other drivers were like, well, this is not fair. It's going to be dangerous to have him out there because no one's keeping an eye out for passing cars. And on the fly, he's like, I'll mount a mirror on my car. And it was the very first rear view mirror mm. ever used on a car. Well, that's right. They, they showed that at the museum. To illustrate just how out of touch I am with anything sports, I thought uh, it was a horse track when he said he should go to the track uh, because that's where my mind went. I didn't even the think, brickyard. oh, cars. The Brickyard. I, that doesn't Indianapolis help. Indianapolis 500. Ah, that's the, that's the one. That's one. Yeah, I, I, didn't pick up, I didn't pick up on that until you talked about mounting a mirror. Yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of race tracks. There's dirt tracks and and you know, sprint car tracks. And they, they, when you go there for the the weeks surrounding mm. the 500, there's so much racing going on. It's a great place to be. So anyway, all right. Well, hey, let's wrap this up. I have no idea how long. Oh, up. Uh, uh, Did you win? No, I don't know. I got like two minutes left to bid. So. Um, Unless you want to keep talking. No, actually, there's seven minutes left. Mm. Are you going to win? I don't know yet. Mm. I'll tell you. All right. It's been seven minutes. Well, getting nervous. Maybe <laughs> next week he'll be checking his phone if we film another. Uh, guys, thank you. It's, again, good to be back. What do you think of the tobacco? Well, you know me. Mm -hmm. You know what I like and what mm -hmm. I don't like. It's fine. It was fine. We've we've smoked Northwoods before. 
it's been a while. Um, I've actually tried to stop at Boswell's a couple times and uh, it's never worked out for me. I've, I've flown into uh, to Harrisburg and and was not far from there, but all every time I've done it, I've had to rush over to uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, sometimes to talk to Amish people. Mm. We've come full circle. We have. All right, so we're gonna wrap this up. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks for sticking around this long and uh, hope you make it a great week. We'll see you next week. Yes. Yeah.